Amen. Thank you, Dave. Hey, I just want to give a shout out to that team that makes these because Dave does such a great job on camera and Pastor Jonathan's behind the camera making those videos, editing them down, keeping them real sharp looking there. I also want to just say that uh, this new idea, this praise report, we really would love to have your testimonies of great things that God is doing, has been doing, will be doing in your lives. Uh, so if you have a little praise report and aren't afraid to get on a camera and, and tell a little bit about it, we really would like to make that a new feature on our website. So let's go to the Lord in prayer as we seek him this morning in his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for all the good things you're doing. You're constantly working on our behalf. Your word says that God who watches over you never slumbers or sleeps. You don't take a break from blessing us. You just continue to pour out blessing over blessing over blessing. And we thank you for that. We know that one of the greatest blessings you've ever given us is your word, our source of truth, our source of righteousness. And Father, as we press in, to Romans, the first chapter today, teach us about righteousness. And we thank you for this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you know, I had heard this story about a, a man. He was obviously intoxicated. And he came in, he sat down on a subway car right next to a priest. And a man had a stained tie on and his collar had lipstick on it and he had a half empty bottle of gin sticking out of his pocket and he had a newspaper he was kind of looking over the newspaper there and after a few minutes he turned and he looked at the priest he said say father what causes arthritis and the priest said I'll tell you what causes arthritis it's caused by unrighteous living being with cheap wicked women, too much alcohol, just a basic lack of righteousness. That's what causes arthritis. The man said, well, I'll be darned. I, I never would have guessed that. A few minutes later, the priest had second thoughts about his attitude towards the man, and he nudged him, and he said, listen, I'm, I'm very sorry. I, I didn't mean to come on so strong. I, I, I would like to pray for you. How long have you had arthritis? And the man said, oh, no, I don't have it, Father. I was reading here in the newspaper that the Pope has arthritis. <laughs> so righteousness and unrighteousness are two sides of a coin. And the Apostle Paul is going to address both of them here in Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 1, where he says, Paul a bond servant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles in behalf of his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all the beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul starts out this letter by identifying himself in several ways. One, he calls himself a bondservant of Christ. A bondservant was somebody who was totally dedicated, continually at the disposal of his master. What do you need? I will do it. It meant that Paul was completely devoted to Jesus, who had called him to be a servant. But I, I think about this, that this is really the calling on all of our lives. You know, I was thinking that we use a term sometimes, I'm a born-again Christian. But there's a bit of redundancy in that, because you must be born again to be a Christian. And I believe we are bond servants of Christ because we are born-again Christians. Now, Paul says also that he was called to be an apostle. An apostle was someone who was sent out. That's what the word literally means, somebody who is sent out on an official mission. And Paul says in this case, he was called to be the official messenger of the gospel 
to the Gentiles. And then he adds this in verse 5, that the call of his apostleship is to teach these Gentiles an obedience of faith. This is because obedience should flow from faith. And true faith implies complete submission to the call of God and the will of God. That's why every believer really should be a bond servant, sold out, willing to do whatever God wants. And in fact, Paul's not just identifying himself by using terms like bond servant and apostle. He's identifying the people he's writing to, including us, as saints. We are saints, called by God, loved by God, filled with God's grace and his peace. And these terms are going to be used continually throughout this letter. God's calling, God's love, God's grace, God's peace. You're going to see the entire book of Romans is built around these themes. And Paul wants to encourage and commend these Roman believers, the ones he's writing to, for the testimony of their faith that he has heard about. Because at this time, the, and the writing of this letter, Paul has actually never been to Rome. Now, he will go there eventually, but he hasn't been there yet. So he says this, starting in verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you, always in my prayers, requesting if perhaps now, at last, by the will of God, I will succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, so that I might impart some spiritual gift to you, that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far so that I might obtain some fruit among you, just as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to the uncultured, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. So Paul is saying to them, look, I've wanted to come there many times. It's been in my plans. It just hasn't been in God's plans for me so far. And we know that he's not making this up. We know that it's true because in Acts 19, 21, this is what Luke writes. Now, after these things were finished, Paul's, Paul resolved in the spirit to go to Jerusalem after he had passed through Macedonia and Asia, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. This was a desire of his heart. And then Paul goes back to this key message that he wants to share with them when he comes. He says this in verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now the gospel was considered foolish by the supposedly wise and cultured members of the society. But Paul saw this gospel message as divine wisdom, and he was not embarrassed to share God's way of salvation, no matter what people thought of him. And in today's world, you don't have to go very far, either in person or on social media, to see how many people will ridicule the gospel message and call it foolishness. But to Paul, it was the only true source of power. And that's true for us as well. The life-changing impact of the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit is essential because of the inherent weakness and spiritual inability of our humanity to set ourselves free from the bondage of sin. We need help from a power greater than ourselves. That's a simple reality. And Paul said that this power was available to anyone who was willing to believe. And although salvation is unmerited, meaning it can't be earned, faith is still required for that power to be acquired, to be unleashed into our lives. Faith is the key that opens the door, right? There's a song. You know that song, Ron, right? Faith is the key that opens the door for boarding, right? So 
He also emphasizes here that the gift of salvation, he says, it was offered to the Jewish people first, then to the Gentiles. And that was true in several ways. The first way was the history of the redemption story, the, the salvation story. How did it come? It came down through Abraham, the father of the faith, then through Isaac, then through Jacob, then through David, and ultimately down through Jesus, the line of the Jewish people. But this was also the pattern when Paul says it goes to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. That was the pattern of his missionary outreaches. That's how he preached. He would go to a city, no matter where it was, and he would have probably done the same thing when he reached Rome. He wants to first go to the synagogues, to his people. Paul was Jewish. He wanted to preach to the Jewish people and, and wanted to let them know that Jesus was the Messiah that was prophesied by the Old Testament. Then if the Jewish citizens didn't want to hear it, Paul would turn right around and find Gentiles in that same city and share it with them. And this next verse, it's interesting because this next verse is the verse that called, caused Martin Luther to challenge the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church to start the Protestant Re Reformation because he read this verse and after he was a monk in the Roman Catholic Church and he did everything by ritual, everything by works, and then he read this verse and he said, wait a minute, that's not what God's word says. So he said this, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous one will live by faith. So again, so we can't obtain righteousness on our own. So the only hope we have to ever attain righteousness is to receive it from God as a gift. And that's the key theme of this whole book of Romans, this gift that God's going to give us. And we'll see it again emphasized in chapter 3, the gift of God through faith. In chapter 5, in chapter 10, it's an it's a emphasis that Paul has that righteousness can only be attained through faith. It can't be attained by works. It can't be attained by effort. You can't earn it. You simply receive it by believing. And as a righteous judge, God, through the death of his son, Jesus, justifies, this is a word we're going to see Paul using, justification, or declares righteous the, and forgives the sins of those who come through faith to Jesus as their Savior. And this quote that he has here is actually from Habakkuk 2.4, which said, Behold, as for the impudent one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous one will live by his faith. And this shows us that the idea of justification by faith wasn't new in the New Testament. It was already there in the Old Testament. People just didn't understand it. And after verse 17, Paul's shifting. Remember I said that righteousness and unrighteousness are like two sides of a coin. And Paul's going to look at both sides of that coin here in Romans chapter 1. So in verse 17, here comes the shift from righteousness to unrighteousness. The unrighteousness that comes by rejecting faith, by refusing to come to salvation. And in the New American Standard Bible that I tend to like to, to read and to teach from, there's a heading over this next section. And the heading is unbelief and its consequences. And so Paul says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So the first consequence, and it's a pretty serious consequence of unrighteousness, is it opens us up to be the objects of God's wrath. God as a righteous judge, and he's going to judge immorality, he's going to judge evil, he's going to uh, judge unrighteousness because they demand justice, and God is just. And that Paul says when God's wrath is revealed, meaning his judgment is not limited to the future. He says, when it is revealed, it's being revealed, he says, even now in the world he lives in. So here's one thing we have to understand. The consequences of sin, the consequences from unrighteousness are not something that we might have to face someday. Well, that's true too, but it's not just what's going to happen to us someday. It's what do those unrighteous things do to us right now in tearing our lives down? 
in destroying who we are. Paul uses these two words together, ungodliness and unrighteousness. And the reason why is because moral decay begins with spiritual rebellion. Let me say that again. Moral decay begins with spiritual rebellion. The day I tell God, I don't want to believe in you and I don't want to follow you, I'm on a downward path. And it's a downward spiral. And it's going bad fast. Because the end result of these two things working together, ungodliness and unrighteousness, is that the unrighteous person, Paul says, wants to suppress the truth. So when confronted with the truth of God's righteousness, fallen and sinful people seek to deny it. And by the way, you'll see as we go on this message, I want to emphasize something. I'm not talking about them out there. I'm talking about us because we all at one time did this, denied God's right to tell us how to live our lives. And so we do know what the truth is, and, and, and Paul says here that we are without excuse. He's going to say, listen, everybody knows the truth. Some people just don't want to admit the truth. So here's what, how he says it in the next few verses. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived, being understood by what has been made, so that they are without excuse. What is he saying here? He's saying that the entire created world, all you got to do is walk outside your door, look at the sky, look at the clouds, look at the, the, the plants and the animals around us, and you should know two definite truths without a doubt. One, there is surely a God who created all this, and number two, you are not him. So, so listen, you, you know, people want to suppress that truth and they want to say, oh, no, but I think everything, I think everything just kind of came about by evolution. Baloney. And I'm going to tell you why I can say that so confidently. The evidence against evolution is so strong. The evidence for a creator God is all within DNA, all within science. And, and this is what I can tell you for a fact. The world's leading evolutionist is a man named Richard Dawkins from England. Richard Dawkins, the world's leading evolutionist, when asked, how did life come about on this earth, answered this, it didn't. It couldn't have. Stunning, huh? Now, his answer was even more bizarre when they said, well, then where did it come from? He said, outer space. Well, there's a term called begging the question. Well, if it came from outer space, where did it come from? So not, not even the world's leading evolutionists can tell you that life on this earth has an explanation other than the God that God created it. And what Paul's saying here is, we all know that. We all know by looking around, this is a magnificent planet. And it's got mysteries that have yet to be solved. And we didn't create it. Somebody did. And we are answerable to that creator. Ah, that's where it gets tough. People don't want to answer to God. So what do they do? Paul says they suppress the truth. They say, nah, nah, this, this is all explainable by natural causes. Nah, it's really not. So the invisible God is revealed through the visible world of creation everywhere we look. And this revelation is enough to leave all of humanity, what Paul's saying here, with no excuse for why they chose to deny God's existence. And that's why Paul says next that they did know. He says they did know there was a God. Listen to what he says next. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their reasoning and their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible mankind, of birds, four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. 
People worship all kinds of stuff instead of worshiping God. Paul says that all of humanity has had the opportunity to know God through the revelation of his creation. Therefore, humanity's greatest sin, the root of all of our sin, is our refusal to acknowledge what's already known to be true. Suppressing the truth in unrighteousness is what he calls it. And people simply refuse to honor God and to give thanks to him. They might worship what he created. Okay, there's not, listen, God gave us the mandate to take care of the world around us. He didn't tell us to worship it. He told us to worship him. So, so people take the wonders of nature and the beauty of the environment, and they say, this is wonderful stuff, as if it just appeared by magic. They won't acknowledge the one who created it all. And the consequence, Paul says, of rejecting God as the creator is that their minds and their hearts grow dark. And that's why he says, claiming to be wise, they became fools. Intellectual arrogance before God brings forth a twisted sense of values. Worship of God is exchanged for a devotion of man-made idols. And I'm going to tell you something. Like I said, this is not about them. This is about us. Because at one time, I was a committed, card-carrying, full-fledged atheist. And I was smart. I was smart. My junior year of high school, I was ranked number one in a class of 300 people. I was a smart person by the world's standards. But I was a fool, absolute fool, because I denied God's existence. And I remember sometime a, a, a girl who respected me, because I was supposedly a smart guy, said, well, what about God? What about how's he fit into all this? This is the answer I gave her. Listen to me, honey. There was a big ball of gas in the sky. It exploded. Here we are. Deal with it. That sound like foolishness to you? Because it sure sounds like foolishness to me, and it came out of my own mouth. But here's what happens. This is what happens when twisted worship becomes not about God, but about something we decide to worship. Now, impurity becomes acceptable. This is, the, this is where unrighteousness goes, okay? So now Paul says this, therefore God gave them up to vile impurity in the lust of their hearts so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for falsehood and worship and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Now that is a general way of saying that things, if you don't do things the right way, then things will get twisted and they will become perverted. So that when we deny the truth, we're going to allow untruth to twist reality. And so Paul is going to literally break it down now. These are hard scriptures to, to hear in our culture today. People say, oh, you shouldn't even cover those scriptures. Well, it's God's word. So here's the real nitty gritty as Paul lays it out here, starting in verse 26. For this reason, what reason? The fact that they have twisted their minds into impurity. He says, for this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for that which is contrary to nature. And likewise, the men too abandoned natural relations with women and burned in their desire toward one another, males with males, committing shameful acts and receiving in their own persons the penalty of their error. Here's how one commentary summed up that little piece. The effect of perverting the instinct to worship God is the perversion of other instincts from their proper functions. The consequence is degradation of the body, domination by lust, the disintegration of what is truly natural, and bondage to uncontrollable passions. So, I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to clarify a couple things that are important when we hit those verses, because we've got to watch our hearts. We've got to watch our attitudes towards others. So I want to tell you three things that I think are important to put those verses in perspective. Number one, there is only one unpardonable sin mentioned in the Bible. It's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It's not this. It's not unpardonable. Number two, all people struggle with sexual sin. Well, I'll say most. 
I'll say that includes me. Okay, so so we have all kinds, a, a gamut of, of sexual sin that people fall into. It, pornography is the number one, the number one use of the internet on a daily basis, pornography. So to be pointing at people, a certain group of people saying, man, they are messed up, misses the point. Man, we're messed up. And the other thing is this, gay people, transgender people, they need salvation. They need forgiveness the same way we're going to get it, as Paul talks about here, through faith in Jesus Christ. And if we target a subgroup of people with hostility and rejection, how are they going to receive the gospel? All right, so as Paul explains next, it's already going to be hard enough for some folks to accept the truth. And we certainly don't need to make it harder. He says this in verse 28. Just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a depraved mind to do those things that are not proper. God gave them up. Man, I don't want God to give up on me. He gave them up. It's so sad. He says, look, you want to choose sin over me? Well, okay. You want to worship at the altar of sin rather than worshiping me? Well, have at it. And then see how that works for you. And what's the end result of that path? It's always going to be the same thing. So Paul says this, people, in verse 29, people having been filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, and evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice, they are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unfeeling, and unmerciful. And all they, though they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice those things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but they also approve of those who practice them. Here's a little interesting fact about this thing that Paul just wrote here. Paul is writing the letter to the Romans. He's not in Rome. Where is he? He's in Corinth. He's writing this letter in Corinth when he's with the Corinthians. And Corinth was one of the most sinful cities in the entire world. If you wanted to insult somebody, you wanted to talk about, like, what a loser they were, you'd say, damn, he's like a Corinthian, man. That's how bad it was there. And Paul's there, and all he has to do is look out his window, and he sees all this unrighteous behavior everywhere he looks. And the fact is that the rejection of the reality of God's judgment not only removes all forms of restraint, but it actually becomes a source of further rebellion because people start to encourage other people to sin. They cheer them on. My way of saying that is this. Sinners going to sin. But sinners going to try to get others to sin too. Misery loves company. If I'm heading down a downward spiral, I'll take somebody with me. Now, I think it's important to bring balance to all this. This kind of a chapter can stir stuff up in us. In our lives, let me tell you something. Our old nature is unrighteous. We have the righteousness of Christ, but there's that battle, and Paul's going to talk about it all in Romans chapter 7, the battle between our old nature, which is unrighteous, and the new nature we've been given in Christ. And so when we read stuff like this, it can stir up our old nature in what I would call self-righteousness to start thinking, I'm better than everybody else. I don't do things like they do. Yeah, but that's not the point. Look at, look at I want to just flip over 1 Corinthians 6 and remind you of what Paul said here. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor adulterers, nor idolaters, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the habitually drunk, nor verbal abusers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Look at the next thing he says. Such were some of you. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Unrighteousness of any form has no inheritance in God's kingdom. None of it. Sexual sin, not going to be allowed. Stealing, not allowed. Greed, not allowed. Drunkenness, not allowed. 
It's not, not acceptable to a holy God to allow those things into his presence. But what did Paul say? Such were some of us before we were washed by the blood of Jesus, sanctified by his grace and justified by only one thing, by putting our faith in him. So when we see people around us that are still trapped in the darkness, that are still making those sinful choices, that are rejecting the truth and walking in unrighteousness, before we're too quick to judge them, we just want to stop and recall this important truth. There, but for the grace of God, go I. And I want to just close out the message today with these words from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Because I think it's very appropriate as we celebrate his legacy tomorrow to hear what he had to say about grace. He said, God's grace stands over man's sin. Now the grace of God is not just some passing phrase, not just some old concept that we should be ashamed to use now. It's not just some mechanical concept that has no deep meaning. Grace has a very vital place in any life. It has a very vital place in understanding the whole predicament of man and the whole predicament of the universe. For you can never understand life until you understand the meaning of the grace of God. The whole of life hinges on the ever-flowing power and the ever-flowing stream of God's grace. Grace is just that something that God gives us. It's a gift that we don't merit, that we don't deserve, but which we so desperately need. That's grace, and none of us could live without it. Here's a little song called, By the Grace of God. His love is like the mighty ocean His love for me will never stop His arms are strong enough to carry me Through it all by the grace of God So high upon His shoulders Safely brought thus far Helper of my helpless soul, King of broken hearts. His love is like the mighty ocean. His love for me will never stop. Oh, his arms are strong enough to carry me through it all by the grace of God. You are the passion of my life, Lord Jesus. You are the song within my soul. My strength, my hope, my all in all is you. Jesus, you. When breath grows still and night draws near, I will not be afraid. I know the plans he has for me Don't finish at my grave His love is like the mighty ocean 
His love for me will never stop. Oh, his arms are strong enough to carry me through it all by the grace of God. Through it all by the grace of God. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your grace. We thank you that your word brings us back to reality and reminds us that you are the creator of the universe. We are answerable to you. And all of us at some point in our lives chose to walk away from you, apart from you, reject you, and desire to run our own lives. And we've felt the consequences of unrighteousness but now we've felt the consequences of grace. And grace is so much stronger. Where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. We thank you today for your grace. We thank you that we can be vessels of that grace to those in the world who are still struggling, who are still lost, who are still confused. And let us do so with a humble heart, not in judgment, not in condemnation, but in mercy, in love, and a desire to lift up our fellow human beings through the same grace by which we've been saved. And we just thank you and praise you and give you glory for this today. In Jesus' name, amen.